Parshas Nasho, Naso. It is one of the longest Parshots in all of our study. The reason why that we're concentrating on it tonight and tomorrow is so that we can get through it. <laughs> and by Hashem's loving kindness, we'll do it. It goes from chapter 4 of Bed Midbar. I'm sorry, of, of um, yeah, Bed Midbar to chapter, end of chapter 7. Now, let's talk about a couple of fundamental things it's important to, to know about this uh, text. Uh, Parsha Naso, as I said, uh, is an is a extremely long Parsha. But there's something really interesting. If, if you read it this week, you'll discover it repeats itself over and over and over again. Ad nauseum, right? And it's like if it was modern English writing, uh, they, for example, when they were listing out the, the leaders, they would have just said there's a total of X amount of leaders and be done with it. Instead, they, they name a tribe and they'll go one. And they'll name another tribe and then a one. And they go through this whole list and this, is, this repetitive style is important. Why do you think that the Torah often does this? And there are other places in the Torah where um, text is repeated like this, like it's, it is drawn out. It kind of reminds me of Abraham Lincoln's speech, you know, seven score and goes through this whole long explanation. Why didn't he just say seven, you know, 27 years ago, 127 years ago? Yes, sir. So what do you think? Speak loud. To uh, show how important each of the leaders was. Right. So the emphasis is that no one is taken taken for granted, right? Everyone is important. And so the fact that they repetitively go along with it. But now we're going to find out it's not just with the leaders, but it's also with the service. With, with actually bringing how to bring the offering and what are they to do, exactly how it's done. And it repeats itself based on each individual's responsibility, which it, it just is amazing to me. Once again, pointing out to the importance. Now, I don't know if it was you and I, who we were having a discussion, uh, who I was having a discussion with, but the discussion was the difference between postmodern learning in school and what learning would be in Judaism in yeshiva, for example. Um, in the school system, in the college system, it's generally a person that lectures. They give a lesson. They have a lesson plan. Do you do this in your class? You lecture. Uh, and you, and you, obviously, if somebody has a question, you'll answer the question. But generally, it's a lecture. You transmit, they receive. Well, in Judaism, it is actually about a dialogue and a, a discussion about the text. That's what a kolel or yeshiva does, is a student has a teacher or a student along with another student in yeshiva will spend time um, toiling over the text and having discussions and pulling other books out of the closet, out of the wall, and, and, and trying to find out what the sages of blessed memory said about the text. And therefore, it makes it much more easier to learn. For example, our Thursday class, which is seemingly starting to grow and looks good, the Thursday class is very much like that because we have a, a general discussion and a dialogue about the text and I get I personally get so much out of it because I go home and I'm remembering the text because we talked about it. Could you imagine what would happen in our school system if they would provide students the ability mm -hmm. to have discussion like a logical thinking discussion over concepts from history to science etc. And I think that's another reason why that we, we are growing up uh, a whole generation of children and young people, and to include probably f from my age, I don't, I don't know, forward, that are not used to reason and logic discussions. Not used to sitting down and saying, okay, what you are saying sounds good, but what's the basis of it? What's the substance of it? Yes. I think part of that is our society doesn't allow different opinions. Right. 
Right. They don't want and it's to actually hear getting it. worse. Like them, they right. don't want to hear what you have to say. It's actually getting worse. As a matter of fact, in the college system now, if a student has a differing opinion from the professor, uh, you, you know that you're getting ready to be nixed. I had a, f a friend of mine that was going, uh, working on his master's. He went to the same college that I went to. And there was this particular uh, instructor there. Uh, she, she was of an alternate lifestyle and uh, was very opinionated about certain issues. And so she asked them all to write a paper based on, on, the, on research on XYZ. So he came back with research that was in direct opposition to what she teaches, right? All truthful. And he said, this is my concern. Do I turn it in? Because it's the research is solid, or do I tell her what she wants to hear? And so he decided to turn it in, got a horrible grade. As a matter of fact, she said it was unacceptable. He then rewrote it to tell her what she wanted, and he got a better grade. Now, what, is that, what, what does that do to a society that, that has to conform itself without thinking? And this is one of the things that we all in this room have found, and those people who watch the class have found so informative about Judaism and about Torah, that we're encouraged to ask questions. If you're not asking questions, what we're learning quickly, you're not really being, uh, um, what's the word for it? You're not exhibiting the... Um, critical thinking. Yeah, you, 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 without critical thinking, you, you really cannot express Torah and the importance of Torah. Uh, we were talking about with uh, one individual the other day about passive, a passive relationship with Hashem. Because remember, we, the text a long time said, if, if you were casual with Hashem, he'll be casual with you. And so we're talking about a passive. And the guy was like, well, what do you mean about passive relationship with Hashem? And I said, if you're never, if you're in an environment where you, you're told everything's been taken care of for you, don't ask questions. Just go along with the program, and you're all right. Versus ask questions because your relationship with God is determined on the questions you inquire and how, what you do about the questions you ask, right? Because if we ask questions and don't do anything about it, there's no use in asking questions. So what we find is this incredible thing that is laid out in this text and in several other texts, texts that show this repetitive nature it's trying to teach us something. It's trying to, it's pointing to the direction that, uh, think about this. Whenever children were learning the oral Torah, and they would, or even the written Torah, and the father would sit and read this text, and it would be so repetitive, those children would walk away knowing the context of the text. Not every text in Torah is that way, but this is. So the first part, is the Lord spoke to Moshe, uh, verse 21, chapter 4, and to Aaron, saying, Take also the senses of the Gershonites <coughs> by their parental house, by their families, number them from 30 years up to 50 years, all who are subject to serve, to work in the tent of meeting. This is the duty of the Gershonite family as the service as to service and burdens they take the tabernacle curtains it explains the tent of meeting it covers and the covering of the multicolored skin that is on top of it and the entrance of the screen and the tent of meeting the court hangings the screen of the entrance closure gate that is over the tabernacle and by the altar surrounding it their cords and all their service instru instruments and whatever is delivered to them this is how they serve so what is their obligation their obligation is for everything in the tent of meeting, right? And so they were to fold it up properly and to pack it properly for the move. Now, what happened to the Gershonites when the tabernacle was built? When the, when the temple was built. I'm sorry, the, 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 the permanent temple. Wow, here's a good one. Huh? They, didn't have to get they were like, we got out of that one, didn't we? Well, it's interesting. Those other tribes that were involved, that were not koanim for the purpose of uh, temple service, uh, 
they uh, they uh, they adopted other mm. operations within the tabernacle within the temple. Like for example, um, the singing or what do you call it, the the cantering or the singing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like this whole tribe, that was their job, was to, to sing, to, was to, to sing the songs. Um, which I, you know, I'm thinking about, can you imagine what it's going to be like to, to see the operation of the temple? Because we'll be able to see it all over the internet, and to hear the music and hear the voices sing, it's going to be incredible. Um, it says... Uh, all the duties of the Gershonites, all their burdens and all their service shall be done by, uh, by the word of Hashem, of Aaron and his sons. Appoint them as their superiors over the scope of their function. These are the duties of the Gershonite families in the tent of meeting. How many times do I have to say that? Yeah. Right? They're repeating it over and over. This is their duties. This is their duties. Their function is, is under control of Itamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Well, they just said that, right? Uh, as for the 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 uh, Maronites, number them by their families, by their father's house, and number uh, them from thirty years to fifty years. Same repetitive nature over and over. Why they, they mention this is that everybody is their job duties were very important, and their job description was very important. Attention to, detail. Attention to details, absolutely. So nothing was missed. Everybody was was important to their job. Uh, this is the scope of their function. Now, this is uh, their entire service, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, boards, bars, pil pillars, sockets, and the surrounding court pillars, and the sockets, pins, cords, and all the apertures, uh, the uh, appendages of their service by the by by name the instruments within the scope of their function. Now the word by name, Nachmanides, says, understands that by name implies that the sons of Aaron had to micromanage and aside, assign each Levitical task to a particular individual. And another Levite would not, would, could not perform the task assigned to each Levite. So it meant that every individual within that group had a specific task. And that's your job. You do it, and it gets done. Uh, I can, I can, I almost have in my mind watching ants. You know, when you disturb a pile, how they just all go to work, and they all have a job. They're doing what they're doing, and this is pretty much probably what you see is when the tent of meeting would get ready. I mean, the ark would get ready to move. I mean, they'd break down and probably within a couple of hours be ready to move. It's amazing. Um, what verse did we leave off on? By name, 33. These are the duties of the Marite, Marite families, their entire service in the tent of meeting, under the control of Itamar, son of Aaron the priest. Moshe, Aaron, and the princes of the community numbered the uh, Kohathites by their families and their uh, parental house, repetitive again, from 30 years up until 50, all those who are subject to serve for work in the tent of meeting. So I guess 30 to 50, what is the magical reason or what is the reason why 30 to 50 is so important? Because you would think that it would be, I don't know, 15. I mean, a 15-year-old boy is strong. Probably had to do with maturity. Absolutely. Maybe commitment. So by 30 years old, they would have had enough training. For example, the training of a, of a child, whether Levite, uh, Cohen, you know, one of these other uh, groups of people, they would start training very young. And by the time they, they're 30, they're masters at what they're supposed to do. And that's the whole point. So up until you're 30 years old, well, even in the natural world, until you're 30 years old, you think you know everything. Yes, sir? So it, it's not that uh, only the people from 30 to 50 would be working on the tasks. It's just that those would be their tasks, and during uh, actual breakdowns, and packing, they would be the ones. Yeah, the guys from 30 to 50, uh, that was their task to, 
you know, whatever their individual task was to, to break down. And then within that, they had specific assignments. Like, for example, your job is to make sure that you pick up all the sockets that are on the east side of the tabernacle and make sure that they're packed in the box appropriately. That would be your job. And attention to detail was so important that a young man had to be trained to do that. And look, you know, maybe at some level the young men were, um, a, a, what do you call it, like apprenticed, is that like, like an apprenticeship program that could watch and assist? I don't know, we'd have to get like details, but for sure, until they're 30 years old, they're not considered masters of the job. They wouldn't be in charge. They wouldn't be in charge. I mean, so the whole idea is the 30 to 50 years old is the prime age. I guess when you're over, when you're over 50, you're too broke to, to do anything. That represents the year of Jubilee. Yeah, so you get a break. Done. All right, you're done. So, uh, let's see, where are we at? Um, okay, now the Gershonite family, again, 38. Uh, Gershonite number by their family and their parental house from 30 years until 50. All are subject to service for the work of the tent of meeting. Those number in the families by their father's house are 2,630. This was the number of the Gershonite families, all who served in the tent of meeting, whom Moses and Aaron numbered by the word of Hashem. I'm trying to think, was Samson's father a Gershonite? What was Samson's father? He was from Manoah. Well, Manoah, Manoah, right? And he lived among the tribe of Dan. Okay. Tribe of Dan. I, I don't know why I'm, I'm getting, there's some, I don't know, I'll figure it out. Nazarite. Yeah, Nazarite. Uh, so what we have here is a repetitive nature of the numbers of the family members, like how many were in each family. Uh, let me see if we can see some commentary on that. Um, in verse 47, it's the duties of service. The scripture mentions the Levites' work twice in this passage. All who came to perform the duties of service and duties of burdens. It is, it is responsible to say that the two relate to the same act. The repetition is somewhat poetic expression, and the second phrase explains the first. However... Rashi and the majority of the sages prefer the view according to Rabbi Akiva's interpretive method that there were no superfluous statement in the Torah. Rabbi Akiva differed with Rabbi Shmel, who felt that the Torah speaks in the same manner as people. According to the Rashi, states that the first refers to the, the song sung by the Levites accompanied by cymbals and harp while the priest perform the sacrificial service. The second, in, in bearing the burden uh, based on the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, interesting thing, the, the, the verse 40, chapter 40, I mean verse 48, it says, those numbered. Prompted by the same theology discussion in the prior commentary, Numbers Rabbah states that after counting each Levite Levi family, the Torah provides the total, which we really do not need because we can add the, the figures ourselves to emphasize that God cherished the Levites by their, by, for the holy work that they were to perform. Um, there's a, a commentary on, on the text that is interesting from Onkelos. Uh, the unusual caution issued by God in verse, chapter 4, verse 18 through 20, that the Kothites may not gaze upon the holy vessels in the tabernacle, occasion such discussion among our commentators. But it is insightful comment of Samson Raphael Hirsch that, that now commands our attention. He suggests that the warning issued to the Kohathites implied that they dare not see. Meaning, don't look. If you happen, even if you know it's there, don't peek for a second. These sacred vessels only for utilitarian value. That is, the manner in which they are to be used. Rather, they are mandated to understand the symbolic message associated with each of the 
uh, vessels so that they could be appropriately inspired to conduct themselves as servants of the Lord. So the idea would be this. Um, uh, best way I can explain it for, for, for the youths that listen, uh, if you're around uh, like a superstar, right, and you're on the crew working, and there's a VIP, uh, one of the things, the big no-nos for the crew that's working around, uh, don't engage the superstar. You don't go up and stare them down, look them, you know, the whole time they're talking, you're looking them up and down, you don't go up and want to shake their hand, no touchy, right, no talk, don't look, do your job, because if you don't, you'll get fired. I mean, I'm telling you, you'll get fired, not by the superstar, but by the managing crew. So the whole point is, this, the, the whole idea is to understand that the every part of the tabernacle, think about this, every part, even the thing that seems to be the most insignificant, a simple lathe, ladle, right? Don't look at it. Don't even gaze upon it for a second to understand that this is a holy place and must be revered at the highest level. It's so important. So they're told, they're, they're, they're uh, in some way uh, reminded, don't even dare look at these things. Um, there's something of a great value that in, in here's in this perception. Can you suggest what it is? What would you think that uh, any other reasons why this is important, that they're given this command? Yes, ma'am. Wow, that's that's good. Did you catch that? She says that if you think that something while you're while you're working, your job's the most important thing. You need to focus on your job. If you start gazing at things within the uh, within what you're doing, you might lose perspective on what is most important, and that is your job. Very good point. I like that. So let's look at some other Isaac. Uh, are people who focus specifically on mitzvah performance, um, that is, when and how to fulfill the requirements of the commandments, without reflecting on the ultimate purpose and significance of the commandments, uh, missing the point? Think about this. If someone is doing the mitzvah, all of the detail on how to do the mitzvah, without understanding the intention and reflect for the ultimate purpose, is it, is it counterproductive? What would you say? If, no, because they're doing the mitzvah for the sense of doing the mitzvah for somebody else. Or maybe it's learning and teaching somebody else. They're doing the mitzvah, but maybe through somebody else's feedback, they can understand the inner part. Okay, so, yes, you, you, you're right in the sense that you do get credit, obviously, for doing the mitzvah. But there's, it's actually more uh, of an operation of a tzaddik or chesedut that says, that while I'm doing the mitzvah, I need to understand the higher value of what really what this is about. And, and that is, that, look, that, we had a discussion uh, about doing Musar classes, right? And I've been doing some uh, study and getting prepped to do a Musar class on the third Sunday? Is that right? Third Sunday of the month. Uh, and I've been looking at the difference between Musar and Chesedut. Right? There's, there's two concepts that flow there. But the idea is that even with both of them, is to not approach mitzvot, not approach the, the, the instructions of Hashem just on the mechanism, that we have to really look at the value behind it and why is it important for me to master myself in the process. That's the beauty of where we're at, especially for the righteous non-Jew. The mechanism is designed to link us to the value. Absolutely. To put something in our mind. Oh. Right. So once again, it's, it's a mechanism, good, proper thing, but if we're not realizing that it has a connection to a higher value, we're really missing the point. Here's the example. Hashem brings the tabernacle. Now we know that there are the sages of blessed memory say that before the sin of the golden calf, there probably wasn't a need for that. Why? Because everybody would have had the elevation of prophecy. There wouldn't be a need to have forever tabernacle. They would have all been able to face-to-face uh, -face communicate with God. I mean, it's an amazing thing. With that being said, now they have a tabernacle. The purpose of the tabernacle was to develop a framework in which they can now understand how they connect to Hashem. 
and the process of His holiness and the process of purity and cleanliness and all of these things to help them to understand, oh, the Creator of the universe is so complex, but yet we can relate to Him by bringing offerings. And when we bring Him offerings, they have to be at such an elevated level. I mean, it helps to connect. It's more than just, we need a leader. Because that's what the golden calf was about. The Arab Ra was like, we need somebody to, to lead us to Canaan. Right? We need another leader. And this wasn't about their relationship with God. This had nothing to do with their relationship. They felt like we need something to put our focus and attention on. That is bad intention. Does it make sense? With or without Moses, God was going to do what he was going to do. But the point is, the righteous people of Israel did not commit this sin. It was the era of Rob that committed the sin. But why did the righteous people of Israel not commit the sin? Because their trust was in Hashem. Right? It was, uh, what do you call it? Betachon. So, uh, let's consider uh, the mandate to eat matzah on Passover. Here's an example. Can a person become hyper-involved in fulfilling every law associated with the mitzvah? And there are many to the point of overlooking the fact that one can eat matzah all day long for seven or eight days, but unless his, uh, uh, unless this bread of affliction reminds us also to be compassionate toward those who must, who, those who must eat poor man's bread all year long because they suffer from poverty. There is a deficiency in matzah performance, however, correctly one abides by the letter of the law, of course. But the idea is that when you eat it, recognizing there are some people who have to eat this bread all the time because they can't afford bread. That's understanding the whole purpose of it. So, anyway, so where are we at on time? We're doing okay so far? Okay. Anybody have any comments or questions? No? In those days, a box of mustard costs, as it says, a box of mustard costs more than a loaf of bread. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's postmodern times. It's not, it's not in Israel. Listen, when you make it your own, it's much cheaper. The whole idea, if you order the, the nice stuff that comes from Israel, you need to mortgage the house to do that. I mean, so, yes. In that context, yes, you're right. It's not the bread of poverty. It's the bread of wealth. Okay, but in the context of true life during this time, that was the simplest, cheapest bread to make. Didn't cost you anything. Yes, sir. When we were talking about what's the it's like building a bridge. You can repair a bridge or build one without really knowing what it's for. But if you build a bridge with the intent to drop it, hit the other side, it's going to be a much better bridge. Well, I, well I, I like that analogy because what you're saying is if you're building a bridge just to build a bridge and you don't know that there are 16 ton trucks that will have to cross it, you might build a bridge that's not going to be adequate. So I, I like that too. So I, I like this other analogy too I heard this week. I think on. Well, it's correct. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So I, I heard this great analogy by one of the rabbis on the Torah Learning Channel, shameless plug, TorahLandernChannel.com. Uh, he says, um, a map's very important, but a map can't get you to where you don't know you, you need to go. Only you have got to know where you're supposed to be. A map's great, but if you don't know where you're supposed to be, that map's useless to you. Now think about this for a second. The Torah is great. But if you don't know who you're supposed to be and where you're supposed to be, the Torah is not going to be able to get you to where you don't know where you're supposed to go. So everybody needs to become conscious of where they're supposed to be. Let me tell you, uh, generally in society today, most people don't even think about personal growth, do they? Like, I need to improve myself. Nobody thinks about that. We're in a self-centered world. If anything, what are they thinking? All of you need to improve yourself. So you make my life more comfortable. So in reality, we're all supposed to be looking for uh, the deeper meaning behind all of the mitzvah here. Yes? What, what comes to my mind, or what came to my mind when you were talking about that, was just the simple blessing of washing your hands right. before bread or after the bathroom or right. whatever. 
you can just mumble it off and say it. Right. Right. But if it doesn't go inside, right. or come forth from the inside out, right. then you're just speaking words. You know, you know, I, I have suggested to some people that uh, if they're having a hard time making that like real from the inside, then stop doing that and start having a conversation with Hashem. When you, when you, if that's the, if you're not being able to do it, then when you come out of the restroom, when you wake up in the morning, then you have a conversation with Hashem about what you're doing, and why it's important to have pure hands and Thank you that yes, you right, exactly, exactly, and that way you can be, you can begin to comprehend the intent behind the prayer, and then start the prayer. Um, Let's hit this, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll wrap up here in a minute. It says, um, "The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this is chapter five, verse one, and then two. Command the Israelites to send all those who should be quarantined from the camp, and all with discharge, and all are made in, uh, impure, and through the impure uh, human being, send male and female, put them out of the camp, so they do not defile their camp in the midst of my presence, Lashkina." Now, what are we talking about impurity? Does this mean that there were sinners? No. So, impurity is not about sin, okay? It's about the ritual pure impurity. Uh, you being a nurse, understanding the need for, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, sterilization. Sterilization. Uh, it's, it's like paramount in everything that you do in your job. And if you, if you are not completely... Um, properly prepped, then you should not perform the business at all. And in that case, the hospital does this all the time. No one is allowed in the hospital who has some type of infection unless they're going to be treated, correct? Uh, so, this is basically what we're talking about. It says here, quarantine. Um, the, the, the Hebrew word, tsarua, frequently defined as leprous, as, is, as described here. Uh, see commentary on Leviticus 13. One, onculos, quarantine, is, is, is in-oriented in Sifri, states, he sits alone outside the camp. There were three camps. The center encampment was the camp of Shekinah, where the Kohanim were in the temple. Uh, Surrounding it was the Levite camp, and around the Levites were the twelve tribes. Of, uh, the, the Israel camp is fixed formations, as described in chapter 1. The leper was excluded from all three camps. People with a discharge could remain in the Israelite camp, but could not remain in the other two camps. So when it talks about here, a person with discharge could remain in the Israelite section, like the general tribe section, but not on the inside where the Levites and the Kohenim were. Does that make sense? So, generally, who would that affect? The Kohenim. Right? So, it would be the Kohenim or the Levite who had uh, a lesion or some type of, uh, you know, infection. They would go out and be with the rest of the Israelite, the twelve tribe, the other tribes. If it was a regular Israelite, he'd have to go out. Yeah, and if it's a regular Israelite, thanks for saying that, he would end up going further out to the the the, uh, the Geratoshav or whatever. Follows? So there's four layers. You got the temple, then you've got the Kohanim, then you've got the Levites, and then you've got the. Is it kind of like the layers of how God is hidden in the earth? Oh, I would think so. Yeah, I would think so. Because you see that the and, and look, we we go back uh, several chapters where the Levites atone for his family, or the high priest atones for the, his family, the Levites, the Kohanim. The Kohanim are the priests of the nation. The nation are the priests, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the Kohanim are priests to the Israelite nation, the Jewish people, and the Jewish people are priests to the nations. So you see those, those dish, different sections. Yes, ma'am. So then where would a gear go? He fell under this the, category. The gear would be right on the, on the outside of the Israelites camp, in camp. Unless he were married into the family. But if he becomes contaminated, yeah. where does he go? Uh, he's, it doesn't say that he has to go anywhere else but stay where he's at. Because the deal is this. No, let me tell you why. Because this contamination wasn't about contaminating other people. 
Well, I guess it would be. It could if they were doing temple service. What I'm saying, it would be attached to doing temple service. The the gear wouldn't be doing any temple service. They could bring an offering, but if they are are not pure and they haven't they're not haven't mikvahed and cleaned up, and they have an issue, then they can't bring an offering. But they don't have to go outside of their own camp. There, I don't know. Is there anything recorded? I don't know. But the way I've always envisioned it was because every time you read about any kind of gerim, it's almost always associated with the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. They almost always absorb. So they would probably be camped near that. Yeah, I could see and that. As far as the outer perimeter of the camp, that's also where everyone had to go for bathroom purposes. Right. So that's it's telling you, you know, get out of the camp. Right. No impurity, no right. unsanitary. So they had to walk their dogs outside the camp. I don't even know if they had dogs. <laughs> Anything else? No? Yeah. Later? Okay. Did I just ruin your idea? Is that what it is? Would that mean that flocks were also kept outside? That what? Would that mean that also that flocks and herds were kept outside of the camp? I would think so. Yeah, I can't imagine them being inside the camp. Just think of the logistics of that. You've got six million people. How big is that camp? If you're right here, how far are you going to have to go to get outside the camp? <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, to go to the bathroom. Well, I would... Uh, I would think that logistically, ah, look, the bird loves Torah. Oh. Never mind. I, I know that the Muslim communities and cities, ancient, ancient times, they had a lot of the same thing. You had to go to the bathroom, you had to leave the city. Right. Now, I think that was kind of normal. Very common thing. Yeah, right. I don't know how it worked out. But I know well, it, you know, and it took, it took Europeans uh, several plagues to figure out that it, you don't dump your waste in the street. Mm -hmm. I don't think they figured that out till the late 1800s. I mean, this particular encampment, if you've ever seen a picture of it, it's a, it's a square. Right. So if you had to leave, you could actually go out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a shorter distance yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. And they did find archaeological evidence at Qumran of mm -hmm. where the restrooms, oh. where the area was outside the camp. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ankylos talks about this whole idea of impure human beings. He says, mm -hmm. he adds a word. Uh, to make impure, uh, let me e. Rashi asserts that the term means bones, and the phrase means people who become impure by touching human bones. The word has this meaning in place, such as Genesis Rabbah 78, uh, 78, dot, uh, dot one, uh, 78 verse 1. Uh, Luzato uh, argues persuasively that Rashi is incorrect. And he states that Ankylos Targumus uses uh, gama, yeah, gamei for bones and always treats tamai as impure. Thus, he concludes the Targum should be rendered all who are made impure through impure human beings. Not only people who die, but people who might have. Uh, uh, a fluid, a, a sore, or something like that, and you touch them, then that would be considered impurity, and you wouldn't want you wouldn't want to be touched. Now I understand why Moses was always outside the camp. Moses was outside the camp because to stay in communication with God, he could not be anywhere near impure people. He was carrying the bones of Joseph. Of that too. Mm -hmm. He was carrying what? The bones of Joseph. But I don't know. Was he literally carrying the bones of Joseph? I don't know. They brought him out of Egypt. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'd have to see what the... be interesting to find that out. But I was thinking because he was outside the camp, because he was away from anything that would interrupt his... My, my concern would be is how could he be in communication with Hashem in the tent of meeting with the bones of Joseph there? Well, surely the bones of Joseph wouldn't be in the tent I wouldn't think so. So... We'll look at it and see. Um, let's see. Um, it says in um, verse 6, Speak with the Israelites. When a man or woman commits a wrong to another, therefore trespass it before the Lord. Let's see what this means to do a wrong. What's this? Verse 6. Ankylos and Pseudo-Jonathan Jonathan choose uh, Chov for both Chatot and 
and asham in the verse. Uh, this is the word sefri zuta. Uh, differently into two wrong behaviors since the coming. Let's see, I'm, I'm sorry, the discussion. Wrong person specified the verse. Oh, this is this is about something we talked about a couple of weeks ago. States the passage deals with someone who is robbed and then swore falsely about robbery. A breach of trust. A breach of trust, right. <laughs> so, uh, for example, one fellow commits a crime, and I know he committed a crime, but I don't say when I'm asked to witness against it, you know, admit it. So. Okay, I think we'll pick up, we'll pick up here uh, tomorrow on, on verse 7. The remedy for um, for one becoming contaminated because of another, which uh, you know, look, uh, I find it interesting how Hashem views, and you know, we talk about the law and how does it uh, get one second here, uh, how the Torah law um, reveals uh, Hashem's essence and what He sees about justice, etc., and that He considers an individual contaminated and if anything guilty of the same infraction and sin that someone else commits if that person doesn't do something about the infraction. Does that make sense? So for example, we're best buds and I see him steal our neighbor's chicken and I tell him, I don't say anything to him. If anything, I just kind of ignore it like I didn't see it and then someone comes up and says, hey, I saw him do it. Didn't you see him do it? And I go, I I won't say anything. I'm just as guilty as he is. Because you didn't lie to it? Or because you didn't report it? I did, well, I did uh, both. I, li I lied and then I, I, I mean, I didn't report it and then I lied when he was asked to do it. So the point would be is even things that are, that we see that are going on around us, and this is what, this really affects the, the oh. non-Jew, the B'nai Noach, the Ben Noach, Bat Noach, is we're supposed to be about justice in the world. And when we see something is done around us that is unjust, we should be we should be willing to say something or do something about it. And that's why I like being a democratic republic. We can vote. We can actually say this. We're going to take a stand and try to find people in office who will make a stand against these kinds of atrocities. That concludes this class, this lecture, and we shall go to the Q and A.